We are Mama and I, Julia, aged just 17. 17 in April 1956. This was in May, June, July, July the 20th. My mother, on the right, um, looking as looking truly magnificent, myself looking rather like a plum pudding. Our gowns have been made by Victor Stiebel. My mother is wearing the tiara that she stole in front of me from my great-aunt Julia Stoner, the Marquise d'Aupoul. She stole this in February, here's a tiara, in February 1950 from my aunt's deathbed, together with a great deal of Fabergé and some memorabilia, prayer books, which she gave to me to keep my mouth shut. But at the age of 11, I really couldn't understand what she was doing at all. I realise now. Anyway, here is a formidable Jeanne. Um, she would have been in her early 40s. Quite magnificent. Then we have an early photograph of Jeanne taken by Cecil Beaton after she had after she had testified at the inquest of the suicide of Cecil Beaton's tragic gay brother, Reggie Beaton. Here's a photograph of my father, gradually succumbing to the poison. As you notice from the early photograph, his beautiful figure was entirely bloated. But the photograph on the right of my mother is quite dramatically startling, and that would have been in the early 1933, I think. Not long before she met von Ribbentrop, and the ambassador, von Hirsch, who was murdered at Ribbentrop's behest with, I think it was strychnine poisoning. Sherman and our housekeeper, who followed Ruby Heath, Phyllis Messenger. This was in the, the, town, the British Hall at Maidens Grove. And the little photograph beneath is of my great-great-grandfather, Spanish grandfather's house, La Alqueria, between Jerez and Cadiz, the Zulueta property. My mama told me that the head of the village priest was kicked down the road. I went there to visit Ana Maria, um, the Countess of Torre Diaz, my great-aunt. And here's a man very startlingly wonderful in my life. Sir John Balfour, very considerable and remarkable diplomat, who together with my godmother tried to rescue me from this very bizarre situation whereby I was being described as mad, insane, off my head. Sooner I'm dead and sooner Julia Stoner is dead and buried, the better. This has been going on without ceasing since, I would say, the time I was first in America in 1961. But especially after my father's strange death and cooked will. So therefore no one would have to listen to me ever. Nor could I get a job, nor could I keep a job. Because I was strangely insane, I quote. In the next episode I will show you the letter which endorses this. And then on the back here, growing up as a child, my father's remarkable housekeeper, Ruby Martha Eliza Heath, who came from Newmarket. She had bright red hair, and she was an angel in my life. I used to run down the drive at Stoner to her village house, village cottage, crying because I could understand nothing. She would always in wrap her arms around me in great kindness and consideration. I loved her deeply. She died in Newmarket, tragically, not so long after my father. I think it was 1978 or 79. A great lady, an aristocrat from her heart. To Sherman, immediately post Dunkirk. So I would have been born in 39, I would have been not yet three. This was in the garden at Assenden Lodge, part of the Stoner Park estate. And this was prior to my father's nervous breakdown in 1944 and acute peritonitis. He was invalided out of the army and my mother had him locked into 
a, be a single bedroom at Claridge's Hotel for his recuperation. And we moved back to Stoner Park within weeks of the end of the war in 1945, against Papa's wishes. This is a little American truck from my excellent, noble grandmother, Mildred. He was a very um, well-known uh, Benedictine priest who'd been a chaplain on the Normandy beaches, Dom Julian Stoner. He was a great rider of horses and he wrote a fascinating book on the Stoner family, which curiously has never been reprinted. I don't understand why, but I apparently was his favourite cousin which is rather touching. I saw him just before my marriage. I, no, that's not true. I went to his funeral just before my marriage in, in February 1963, and he told me if ever I had a son to send him to Worth Abbey, which indeed I did years later. And here, now in the Frick collection, is our great-great-grandmother, Julia, Lady Peel. She hangs in the library, I think, at the Frick Collection on Fifth Avenue in New York. A very beautiful, gentle woman. And it was my mother who stole all her jewellery from Aunt Julie, Julia Stoner, the Marquise Nopoul. You see in her hat, beautiful jewellery on her wrist, beautiful jewellery. Um, my father had and on her rings on her fingers. I don't know if she had belt on her toes, but she and my father had so much in common of their sweet gentleness, which was quite certainly not appreciated by the power for people around them. And here is Captain John Nicholas Brown, the great sailor, who won the Bermudas race, commandant of the New York Yacht Club, my grandmother's first cousin and my father Sherman's nearest blood relative at the helm of one of his famous yachts, I think it's Bolero, escaping from his tyrannical wife Anne Kinsolving Brown. And here is the Rick Mars card of my Devoted, loving, loyal cousin, Father Michael Hollings, Military Cross, who saved me and my little family from total annihilation and character assassination. He also came here to do a spiritual Catholic exorcism because I was so badly haunted. I was especially haunted by my mother. I think the same, nothing much has changed in 2011. She's haunted me from beyond the grave. And as I was a, a daughter, I wish she wouldn't. I always forgave her, I was a daughter, I was always loyal to her. She found that exceptionally annoying. But I was really saved by the Infanta Maria Cristina, Crista, Tia Crista, and by Jock Balfour. Especially when we were starving in Chiswick, openly starving. One last picture for this episode, I think. This is meant, I was not, my mother didn't throw me away till I was 17, and I think I must have been three in 1942, or four, I'm not sure. But by 1956, she'd had enough. And now, 1957, I was out. Last but not least for this episode, here is the wonderful aunt, my great aunt, Julia, Aunt Julie, the Marquise de Poule, in a frame made by Fabergé, which belonged to King George V when he was Duke of York. 
because Aunt Julie was unofficially his fiancée. And she was the great protector of my life as a little girl when she used to take me to Mass in the chapel at Stoner and hold my hand and she gave me a coral rosary. I thought she was magic. I still think she was magic. Well, I hope um, that you will have enjoyed and been um, given curiosity by the first episode of my strange life and times. Not yet over, as far as I know. And I look forward to continuing in the second episode. Um, it's certainly been a unique life. I, did, I could hardly have chosen it, but I have to live it. And I would just say, for all those out there of you who are Catholics, I have never, never lost my faith. So I've lost my faith in the Catholic hierarchy of England a very long time ago. <laughs> Thank you.